reaction. Yeah, good. The next person is going to be coming up. Yeah, actually, I am too. So each person is going to be guests. You want to get 45 minutes together, and you go an hour, and the next person is going out. That's 45 minutes. Okay, Mark and Liz and Lee, you can do some distancing with time. Hours. Okay, whoever. Well, did you say Jackson? Jackson, are you trying to fit the uh, Robert Eisenman in this evening? So go ahead. So are we going to start? Yes, you are. You're already ready to go. Amen. Hey, <clears throat> if you say it's the edited out anyway. So you can... Exactly. And whenever you see me do this, which I'm probably not going to, that means kind of try to wind it up. Bringing up my PowerPoint. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the calendar here. Uh, and I know the majority of the group here has a uh, uh, consideration of a Wednesday start. And, uh, and I can appreciate some of the uh, points where several people are coming from. But uh, my premise is going back to the original word in Hebrew. Uh, and I'm coming up with foundations that are leading me to a, a different start. <clears throat> and so... Uh, so it might be a little bit of a paradigm shift. I don't know. I don't know if paradigm shift is the right word for this, but but um, so uh, yeah. So I'm 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 just just using the scripture as my foundation first. Then I'm going to uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this is in two parts, so if we have time on another day, I don't know, I can finish this up. Um, <clears throat> okay. And uh, so, okay, so we got everybody who we got, I guess. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray for a moment, if we would. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for our time together. Pray that you go before us in uh, this presentation. Father, I just pray that only those things that are true, that are presented here, might be retained in our hearts and in our minds, that we might take these things back to your word and determine whether these things are true. Uh, Father, we just thank you for that you've given us uh, the spirit that brought us to this place. And uh, so, Father, just pray you continue to work with us, and we thank you as we ask for your presence in this way. We ask it in your son's name. Okay, so again, uh, this is the basis for everything I try to do is go back to the Hebrew and the Greek to get the answers, and I want to use the scriptures as a basis, and then I'm going to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, of which we do not have facsimile of the original language, and so we are completely reliant upon man's interpretation and his motivation and what he wants us to know. And I believe Yahweh has preserved his word. We, we all read this. We, and I, I believe everybody here believes this. It's, you know what Jeremiah says? Um, that if you want to find God, you got to search for me with everything you got. And it's the honor of kings to search out a map. And so that's what we're trying to do here. And again, now, as I mentioned the other night, this calendar that we're looking at technically I know we refer to it as a 364 day calendar, but uh, in technicality, we should refer to it as an intercalated 360, right? Because Yahweh really hasn't changed. Okay, so <clears throat> as this a quote from the Psalms, as for Yahweh, his way is perfect. And another Psalm, thy way, O Yahweh, is in the sanctuary. 
And so consequently, therefore, the way of the sanctuary has to be perfect, correct? Does that make sense in, in, in light of those? Okay. So if the, if the sanctuary is perfect, that means everything about it. The materials that are used and the symbolic representation thereof, the layout of it, the size and formation of where everything's placed in relation to other things, the design, the, uh, the numeration and the amount of numbers of different things that they're using in various things in the, in the building thereof, and then of course the service itself. And so the timing of the services also, all these things should come together and should be perfect and do it every year. We can appreciate that with a 364 being equally divisible by seven. So the time of the feast being perfect every year. So since numbers, and uh, most everybody here is familiar with the concept of gematria, right? Okay, so we've all heard that. Um, and so since the numbers have significance to the Hebrew, you know, it would make sense to have a particular feast <clears throat> on the appropriate number day of the week that the event had originally occurred. Does that make sense? Would that lend to perfection? Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, I don't know if I actually showed this on the other. No, I guess I have So here it is. I, I had mentioned it the other night when we were talking about um, the moon problem. <clears throat> the uh, the uh, uh, gematria that's brought out with uh, Bollinger. And so here it is. So one, so we have a dual meaning with each one of the seven numbers because we're looking at the number of days of the week. So one means unity or commencement. Two is agreement or difference or disagreement. Uh, completeness or resurrection is number three. Number four means earth or redemption. <clears throat> number five is tabernacle or divine favor. Uh, number six is man or preparation. And number seven, uh, spiritual perfection or life. And again, this is um, the numbers that Bollinger had pulled out of the various verses and all the various stories, Old Testament and New. And this is what he came up with. And, and, and so I actually studied some of the same things he was doing and, and, you know, to verify what he was coming up with. So I feel fairly confident with what he's got. So we know that perfection, we know that we can't add anything to it. We can't take anything away from it. Otherwise, it would be something less than perfection, right? And so we know that Messiah accomplished all the prophecies of himself and did them decently and in order, right on time, with perfection. And these are just some verses relevant to these statements. According to the contract, the covenant, without change. And so consequently, you know, the feast should portray the perfect plan of salvation each year in their proper order, each right on time, to give correct significance to the term his appointed feast. So we know that it's appointed each and every year at the same time. So the perfect calendar uh, feast would correspond to the same day of the week as the original event is commemorated. That would be perfection on the same numbered day of the month each and every year. <clears throat> and so each season would have the same number of days each day of the week on the same numbered day of the month throughout each season and still keep pace with the solar cycle. Sounds like, you know, how, how in the world can you do that? Huh? Mm -hmm. Of course, most of us here, we, we have some familiarity with this calendar already. Now, Jubilee 629 states, each season is 13 perfect weeks, 91 days exactly. And Enoch, in chapter 72, confirms these as 30, 30, and 31 days in a month for those seasons, 91 days. And so the 13 weeks are counted by months. You guys can see this okay, right? Um, to make a complete season in three months, repeated four times to make a year. And Jubilee 632 states the day of the 364, I'm sorry, the days of the, of the 364 day calendar uh, says, will not leave out any day nor disturb 
any fees. And so, you know, it'd be kind of important for us to make sure we got the feast on the right day to match Gamatri, to match the original event, to match the meaning of all the feasts. And this has its um, parallel in Deuteronomy 32 4. <clears throat> okay. And so Enoch mentions that the four intercalary days being inseparable from their office. Uh, the, act, the exactness of the year is accomplished through its separate 364 stations. And again, Jubilee specifically denigrates any observance of the moon as a timepiece to make an abominable day a day of testimony. <laughs> we read that yesterday. And uh, in Jubilee 630, and all the days of the commandments will be two and 50 weeks <clears throat> of days, and these will make the entire year complete. And thus it is engraven and ordained on heavenly tablets. And again, the parallel to that, Deuteronomy 20, verse 18. And David had 52 sabbatical songs, one for each Sabbath service of the year. We know that that's significant, right? Because the lunar calendar is going to have less than that in any given year, or maybe a couple more than that. They're going to add a second year. So, but this is a consistent, you know, we... The psalms are used consistently throughout the year. So we have only 52 sabbatical psalms, which is significant. And that's mentioned in the first psalm scroll in Table 1. And the word Tukufa. You guys familiar with the word Tukufa? Tukufa? Yeah. Okay, so that's mentioned four times in Scripture. Tukufa, right? Well, I, well, you know, maybe in Scripture it might be... Uh, Take, I'm sorry, did you say tekufa, What? So that would be the plural form of that? Okay, so these are the four occurrences here. And so here's the uh, Briggs, what is it, Briggs Driver, and I forgot the guy's name. Brown Driver. Brown Driver Briggs. Uh, is, here's the definition. A finished circuit of the sun at the turn of the year. Okay, and this refers to a year as a cycle of the sun. Any lunar calculation of Takufa at best would be 10 days too short, as Jubilee so says. Okay. <clears throat> 12 months are noted in, the, in these following verses that I've listed here. And, uh, and there are 12 hours in a day for the 12 tribes of Israel, from which there will be 12,000 led by 12 apostles that will enter the gate of cities of 12 foundations through the 12 gates. And so the gematria of number 12 does denote, and again, this is. Uh, E.W. Mulder, uh, that uh, 12 is one of those perfect numbers, and it denotes governmental perfection, whereas 13 denotes rebellion, apostasy, defection, disintegration, revolution, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but there's no record of there ever being a 13th month cycle anywhere in Scripture. So it should be mentioned here that the 13 perfect weeks is that number, recorded in Jubilees that uh, comprised the season were counted by months for three perfect months. Uh, and I suppose an argument could be made that it was because of our rebellion that brought the number 13 into any cycle that caused the flood and all that, right? But in keeping with perfection, even the 13-week seasons, uh, seasons would end on the same intercalary day of the week to redeem the time before the next season, as each season would start on the same day of the week and end on the same day of the week. And so some of this is common knowledge to you guys. Uh, I just thought I'd go through this as somewhat of a review, just for a foundation. So even to the end of the year, to the beginning of the next, all exemplifying their proper meaning in Gematria for signs, which could even relate to feast days, if you look at that word in your quote, and for seasons. All these feasts as covenant tokens, which is what the word oath refers to, in the plan of salvation, and each new season were celebrated in their perfection on the same day of the week, year in and year out. So, of course, we recognize by keeping just 364 days each year within our present generation, in less than 40 years, we're going to fall about a month behind or, or, or thereabouts in our Takufa, uh, because, you know, because we know that... Uh, we're looking at the cycle of uh, the solar cycle being 365 and a quarter. Uh, there are several theories on how this may have been accomplished for the lack of such directives in the Book of Enoch or Jubilees, but what we do know 
is that the feasts have to fall on the same day of the week every year and still meet to Koopa. So scripture does tell us that shortly after Hezekiah had cleansed the temple, that the whole assembly attended at that feast of Matzah. And here's a quote from that verse. And this is 2 Chronicles 30, verses uh, 21 through 23. We'll look, we'll look at it in this context. And it says, quote, took counsel to keep another seven days. And I think most everybody's here familiar with that. Is that right? Okay. Okay. I just didn't know where everybody was at. So I thought I'd kind of start from the beginning. And so back in, in Solomon's day, uh, they had kept an additional seven days as well. A quote from that source in 1 Kings 8, 2, and, and reiterated again in verse 65, where it says, even 14 days during tabernacle. Right. Okay. So we see that there, so here we have two accounts in the scriptures where they're adding seven days, and they're adding it to a feast time which seems to me a very appropriate time to do that when everybody's together. And uh, I would like to think that that was likely done in the sabbatical year. Right? We don't have to worry about planting uh, or any concern about the land necessarily with the soil. So we get together our brothers for twice the amount of time. Kind of makes sense in that <clears throat> regard, but we don't know for sure if that was the time frame. But and there have even been concessions made by Jewish scholars that those who follow this calendar, uh, and Raquel Elior has been mentioned uh, by Jackson a few times here. So here's a quote from her book, The Three Temples. And she says, you know, the seven-day units were added perhaps in the sabbatical year. So she makes that concession as an idea uh, to adapt the schematic Qumran calendar to the true solar calendar. And these, we are told, for the paths of righteousness, I thought this was pretty cool, more accurately translated cycles of righteousness. And we got a lot of scholars here. I think everybody probably knows this here, right? So I'm just talking to the choir here. Okay. <clears throat> and so this word path is, in the Hebrew, it's magal, from the same as uh, 5696. And again, this refers to circular. And so 5696, egol. Uh, from an unused root to mean revolve, circular around. So we can see it, it's, it's look, better used as the word cycle. Path is kind of, could be almost any direction, any course, but a cycle obviously is going to bring you back to the same point, right? So that's a little better word. And so here's a couple of verses to consider with the word cycle versus path. And this is taken from Psalms. This is Psalm 17, uh, 17 verse 4 and 5. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, have kept me from the cycles of the destroyer. Wow, that gives a little different connotation now. Hold up my goings in thy cycles, that my footsteps slip not. And another Psalm, 23, verse 3. He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the cycles of righteousness for his name's sake. And here's a strong one. This is from Proverbs. This is 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, To guard the paths of judgment, and he protects the way of his saints. By the way, do you guys know what the definition of a saint is? If we look at the New Testament, I'm just going to take a little aside here. In the New Testament, every time you see the word saint or saints, it's all the same word in the Greek. It, has to, it happens to be hagios. And we know what hag, hag means in Hebrew. So a saint, by definition of the New Testament, is a peacekeeper. So all those promises that are talked about in the New Testament regarding the saint is for us, the peacekeeper. Okay. And so to guard the paths of judgment, um, so I think that that word paths there, the initial portion of that is probably not controlled. Anyway, so to guard the paths of judgment, and he protects the way of the saints, and then you shall understand righteousness and judgment and, and honesty in every good cycle. Uh, and then uh, this uh, Jubilees 23, 26. And in those days, the children shall begin to study the laws and to seek the commandments and to return to the cycles of righteousness. Oh, look. And here we are. And Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 31 can parallel that as well. Okay. And so, and this has always been an issue amongst the people that I've fellowshiped with who've been keeping the lunar calendar. You know, barley talking about the ripeness, 
right? But, you know, usually the barley hat was typically ripe uh, in Jerusalem. Of course, they, yeah, lunar calendar, they'd make adjustments every three years or about. But, but usually it was pretty close to being ripe in Jerusalem in the first month. But was typically ripe in the lowlands in the 12th month. It was well ripe by the first month. And usually not ripe in the highlands mm. until the second month. Okay. Kind of makes sense, huh? All right. Yet there were green ears in each of these locales by the second week of the first month. Some were a little greener than others, but they were edible. That's the point. When all the people should bring their first fruits into Jerusalem. It didn't say anything about any ripeness. You guys are more scholars. So I think most of you know this. So here's a quote from uh, Leviticus 23, verse, verse, verse 14, right? And ye shall not eat neither bread nor parched wheat nor green ears. It doesn't say anything about being ripe until that same day, until the day when you have brought an offering to your Elohim. And so here's that word, green ears here, it is carmel, it's 3759 uh, in the uh, Strong's, and it means garden produce, fruitful, plentiful, but this word carmel is where we get our word caramel from. What is caramel but a milky sweet substance? So when you take your thumbnail and you put it into that green little fruit berry of the barley, and if you get a little bit of milky substance back, it's caramel. It's edible. That's why it says green or green ear here. Okay. And again, this is part of the reason why the month is referred to as a bee, which means green. Okay. So why is it that the books of Enoch and Jubilees were not accepted as canon? I don't know if I even should waste my time. <laughs> well, you guys know all this stuff. Um, is it because both of these books denigrate the lunar calendar? The one that the Babylonian priests had compelled the Levites to enforce upon their own people. The families most compliant received a priestly oversight upon their fellow Hebrews. And this was the origins of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who came to reject the Savior in part for his denigration of their Sabbaths. Yet most today accept their canon to comprise the only sacred works of God. It's a little problem. And though the 360-day calendar started on the first day of the week from creation, the intercalated 360, or 364-day calendar, added the four intercalary days since the flood, and from that point, the calendar had been consistent, starting and ending at the same time each year, and there was never any break of the seven-day cycle for Yahweh's people. So I, at least I haven't found any evidence to that effect. Okay, so here's a... Um, yeah, here's a quote from that same source that I mentioned the other night about the OSE1, the original scriptures uh, E1. Uh, and it says the Yehudi, which is the Jews, openly admitted to expelling former scripture books which had been accepted as scripture by all Abrahuans, the original, the peoples that believed in the true, well, I guess it was the true bloodline, bloodline of uh, Abraham, for 1,400 years. And Enoch had been accepted scripture for 3,400 years. The first books they expelled and banned even damaged to the extent where Rabbi Akiva has said, here's that quote, anyone who reads them will have no place in the life to come, unquote. Uh -oh. So now you can see the spirit behind the rejection of books like this, Enoch and Jubilee. And so consequently, keep that in mind, that spirit, when it comes to the interpretation of writings that we don't have any facsimile of in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay? Now, again, I'm focusing on the Hebrew language of the scriptures. I just did a, this is just, we just did a preemptory here. Okay. All right. So let's, there's the quote for location. Okay. Uh, I think we reviewed this a little bit. We know the evidence in Exodus 1241, right? Okay. So we've done that. You know, that means the exact identical self-same day. Back when Abraham and, oh yeah, and so I, I let's see, you know, let, me, let, me, let me take you through this. So I, th I think I mentioned this to somebody uh, a couple of days ago, but back when Abraham and Sarah had, uh, uh, when, oh, when Abraham had Sarah taken by Pharaoh, his courtiers inquired of Abraham and he said, 
and this is uh, taken from one of the scrolls. Uh, and they asked me for knowledge of goodness, wisdom, and righteousness, and so I read to them the books of the words of Enoch. And that's taken from. Uh, 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 yeah. Okay. How, how do you how do you interpret that that location? I don't know how to refer to it. It says um, one QAP Genesis. Is that Genesis? Genesis. Okay. Okay, so the Q is for Qumran, AP is for Apocrypha. Okay. Yeah, Column yeah, 20. Yeah, so if indeed Abraham had a scroll of Enoch, possibly in pictographic Hebrew, we could easily conclude that Abraham was keeping the very calendar timepiece that Enoch had prophesied was to come after the worldwide flood, just as we saw in Exodus 12:41. As Shem could have given this to Abraham. We know at least from Jasher that, uh, uh, you know, Abraham was under Shem tutelage for many, many years. Okay, now we're going to get into the meat of this. Okay, does scripture give a day of the week for any numbered day of the month? That would be significant, wouldn't it? Okay, all right. So let's go to Leviticus 23. That's our feast chapter. Let's see what it says. Let's get into the Hebrew here. Now, the Day of Atonement, which is, we all know, is the tenth day of the seventh month, we have to look beyond what we're reading in the English. We have to go back to the Hebrew, especially in this chapter. Because if we go to the Hebrew, this is verse 32, it tells us that the Sabbath there, using the Strong's number, number 7676, it is a Shabbat. Wow. Now, wait a minute. I thought I read the last chapter in Jubilees that, hey, man, you're not supposed to fast on the Sabbath. Oh, we got a little problem again. We don't have the facsimile of Jubilees to look at, do we? Okay. Hold, yeah, we're going to come back. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you into that one in a little bit. Okay. So, but right now, let's, let's, let's just take this as scripture as it says in the Hebrew. We've got the 10th day of the seventh month as a Shabbat, seventh day Sabbath, okay? Not a Shabbaton. We don't find that word there, okay? And we know what seven means. Seven means spiritual perfection and life. What is the Day of Atonement all about? Isn't that the, the full resolution of all sin and to perfect our position before Yahweh? Doesn't that match Gematria? If indeed number seven is spiritual perfection in life. Kind of makes sense to me. But again, everything better line up. Otherwise, I'm kind of wet. Otherwise, the scriptures are kind of wet. Okay. So counting backwards from this date, we can determine the significant day of the week for Passover. We'll get to that. Okay, so now I'm just kind of showing you the calendrical piece here. So here it is. Seven. Now, these numbers in these little boxes here represent the number day of the week. And there's the tenth date of the month there, seventh month. <clears throat> and the dates above. So you kind of see how I'm allocating this. Okay, and here's the rest of the season. Months eight and nine. And then your intercalary day of the last day of the last month. Now, I know that's a little different configuration than what you've been used to. Okay, but just follow, just hear me out if you would. Okay, and again, this is the autumn months. <clears throat> now, let a thing be established by two or three witnesses. So, okay, Mark, well, you got that. Well, do you have a second witness that says that uh, Day of Atonement is indeed a Shabbat? Well, here we have Leviticus 16, verses 29 through 31 talks about the Day of Atonement, and there it is again. It says the Day of Atonement is a Shabbat. It's not say Shabbat. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to keep moving on. We're going to come. We're going to put. We're going to tie all this together. So the scriptural comparison. Let's look at uh, Psalm eighty-one, verse three and five. We know what that is, right? Talking about the Feast of Trumpets. We're going to compare that with Jubilees thirty-four. So in Psalm eighty-one, it says, "Blow up the trumpet in the new." month, I'm going to give you that translation, okay, in the new month, in the time appointed on our solemn feast day, this he ordained in Joseph. So this had its beginnings with what happened with Joseph. This was not 
it did not have its beginning in Genesis 1. It had its beginnings with Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt where I heard a language that I understood. Okay. And so why, so why is this? This is interesting. I find, so this is all according to Yahweh's time that Joseph was taken into Egypt. You know, whether he was sold to the Midian traders at that point or came into the land of Egypt, but it was about this time, the first day of the seventh month. And, uh, <clears throat> and then this, this story continues from this point in Jubilees. And it says in the, in the seventh year of this week, he, Jacob, sent Joseph, okay, we're kind of backing up a little bit, to learn about the welfare of his brothers. And he found them in the land of Dothan. Dothan and they dealt treacherously with him and formed a plot against him. And they sold him to the Ishmaelite merchants. And they brought him down into Egypt. And they sold him to Potiphar, the eunuch of Pharaoh, the chief of the cooks. The eunuch of Pharaoh. Well, now I can understand why Potiphar's wife had a little bit of a problem. Um, and he was the priest also, the priest of the city of Elu. And the sons, and the sons of Jacob slaughtered a kid dipped the coat of Joseph in the blood, and sent it to Jacob, their father, on the tenth day of the seventh month. You guys know this, right? Okay? All right. So, from the Feast of Trumpets to the Day of Atonement were the ten days of all, a day of repentance for each of the ten brothers involved in the awful sin committed against their, if you will, Savior brother on the first to their fathers on this to their father on the tenth, the very day of the week they knew that their father would be in communion with his maker. Okay, on Shabbat. Just, just kind of keep kind of keep holding with me, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so can we fast or afflict our souls on a seven-day Sabbath? Fair question, right? Let's see what it let's see what we got here. Now, this is from R. H. Charles. This is Jubilees 50, verse 12. This is what it says, and this is what throws us off track. It says, and every man who does any work there, I'm talking about the Sabbath, or goes a journey, or tills his farms, lights a fire, rides on any beast, or travels by ship, whoever strikes or kills anything, or whoever fasts or make war on the Sabbath. Now that's according to R.H. Charles, supposedly. Now R.H. Charles has gone through a lot of additions, actually, since 1906. Okay. Now, this is what George Shode says, and this is an 1882 version. He basically says the same thing in that verse, except he ends that sentence with whoever contends or engages in war on the Sabbath doesn't say a thing about fasting. Okay, so now that gives us a little bit more credence. Now, remember, we only had the one little verse to hang our hat on about the idea of not fasting on the Sabbath. We only had one verse. But now I just took it away from you. Mm -hmm. I didn't. George Show did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, consider this thought. Both of these men, talking about R.H. Charles and George Show, were translating Coptic manuscripts from Ethiopia. Only George Show was a professor of Coptic languages and Old Testament pseudepigraphal work at Capital University of Columbus, Ohio. Robert Char Charles was a professor of Greek at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Okay, so the show quote above here is taken from a facsimile that I've got here, whereas the quote from Charles here, this is from an edited version, so I didn't, wasn't able to get a facsimile of Charles. Anyway, so we can see the problem, okay? So now consider this. Now, again, this is taken from Jubilees, and I'm actually taking this from the Charles version, okay? This is uh, Jubilees 34 again. This is uh, <clears throat> verses 17 through 19, and it says, And he, Jacob, mourned for Joseph one year and did not cease, for he said, quote, Let me go down to the grave mourning for my son. And he says, For this reason, for this reason it is ordained, for the children of Israel, that they should afflict themselves on the tenth day of the seventh month. 
on the day that the news which made him weep for Joseph came to Jacob, their father, that they should make atonement for themselves. Why should they make atonement for themselves? Because it's a sin that they did on the Sabbath. And they did it with the same animal that they committed the sin with, right? Okay, and then Jubilee's five. Again, from the Ars Charles version. And, the, and, and of the children of Israel, it has been written and ordained. If they turn to him in righteousness, he will forgive, will, Yahweh, he will forgive all their transgressions and pardon all their sins. It is written and ordained that he should show mercy on the Sabbath with this sin. Now, I'm adding a word there. Sorry, just, I'm sorry, I just added that. You guys couldn't see it. Um, to all who turn from all their guilt once each year. So we're only doing this once each year. And the, oh yeah, this is an interesting concept. And that the rabbis, have you guys heard this? You guys heard it. The, the rabbis refer to the Day of Atonement as the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Come on. They're giving us a hint here. They're not telling us the truth. They said they're just tossing little breadcrumbs out there. <clears throat> okay. So here, here's that whole season here. And all seasons are identical, right? We know that. We know each season is going to start with the same number of day of the week and it's going to end on the same day. Okay. I think we're all familiar with that. So I'm just going to roll through that. Now, now let's go to the next part. Okay, so of all the Shabbatons, that we just went through, we just talked about Shabbat. Of all the Shabbatons, there are three of them that have a specific numbered day of the month all in the seventh month. Okay, so technically this could be a third witness, right? Okay. So Leviticus, again, in Leviticus 23, uh, again, uh, verses 24 and 39. And it tells us that the Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month. It tells us that uh, the uh, either side of the week of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, both the 15th and the 22nd, um, are uh, Holy Convocation days. Okay? And these are all referred to as Shabbaton. It's mentioned Sabbath in our English, but you go back to the Hebrew, it's Shabbaton. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the definition of Shabbat and Shabbat. All right. And so, and you guys recognize that, you know, hey, if the 10th day of the 7th month happens to be a Shabbat, then we know the 15th, the 1st, and the 22nd can't be a Shabbat. But we know that these are sequences of 7. So whatever the 1st is, the 15th has to be, and whatever the 15th is, the 22nd's got to be. Right? And these, consequently, would all be on the Day of Tabernacles and Divine Favor, according to Gematria. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little... Huh? What day, what day is, is that five? five? That's a five. Like what day? Is that four? Is that the fifth day of the week? Or something? Yeah, that, oh, I'm sorry. The fifth day of the week. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't make that point. Okay, so 1, 15, and 22. If, if the 10th of the 7th month is a Shabbat, then 1, 15, and 22 have to be a Thursday the fifth day of the week. Now remember what five means. Five means tabernacles or divine favor. And this was all taken out. Again, this is from Bollinger's exhaustive studies of the scriptures, looking at all the numbers and their meanings, and they all have to be consistent in order for this to have meaning. So that means something. Now, look, now get this. What was one of the biggest things that, that caused him to make the correlation became the foundation of this number, meaning tabernacles and divine favor? is that if you look at all the measurements of the tabernacle and all the numbers of things that are used, it's all divisible by five. Yahweh did that on purpose. Can you say that again? So, so the, 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 the length and the width and the dimensions of the tabernacle itself, the courtyard and everything, all the numbers of things that are used are all visible but five. Now, what's the deal? Now, why did Yahweh pick five? 
Well, here's the reason. In Jubilees 3, 9 and verse 7, it tells us that sin entered this realm on the fifth day of the week. You can calculate that from Jubilees. I challenge anybody here to do that. You can go through it, and you can because it'll tell you in the dates. We all know that the calendar from the very beginning, the first day of creation, started on a first day of the week. And all you do is count backwards, and you come up that the, the day that they sinned was the fifth day of the week. So what better day to come onto the tabernacle but on the very day when sin entered here, I mean, the whole reason why we're doing this plan of salvation and going through the rehearsals every year is to eradicate sin. What better day to do that but on that day? Are you referring to Adam's sin? I mean, yes, I'm talking about Adam's sin. Yeah, the, 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 the sin coming into, the, into this earth, into this universe. On the fifth day, you can calculate that. What's question? Have you seen I wouldn't be surprised. I, have, I haven't gotten quite that far. But yeah. yeah, you guys have a lot more knowledge on other elements of the scrolls than I would, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm open to see to your discussion on this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, so now let's look at Shabbat and Shabbaton. So if we analyze all the Shabbats with all the Shabbatons in their context, we will find that the Strong's evaluation of these two words to be correct, at least in my estimation. Okay, so I took the time to go through all 115 of them, read them in their context. I want to make sure that what I'm looking at with Shabbaton is indeed not a Shabbat, and making sure that when I look at Shabbat, I'm not looking at some other day of the week. Okay, so so I believe that Strong's is correct about this. So 7676 Shabbat is uh, found 70 times in Shabbats, or Shabbatot, is 34 times, a total 104 times. And then uh, 7677, which is the Shabbaton, um, three times is referred to as a Sabbath, and those are the ones that I just mentioned to you, 1, 15, and 22, in the seventh month. And then the eight times is rest. Now, we've many times see, we see the Sabbath of rest to you, right? We see Shabbat of Shabbaton to you. Okay, so Shabbaton means a sacred rest. But Shabbat is specifically a seventh day. Okay? And it was only the first, 15th, and 22nd of the seventh month that's ever been referred to specifically, at least in uh, Leviticus 23, as Shabbaton. Only Shabbat. Shabbat is not mentioned at all. Okay, so the Strong has delineated in the index. Uh, yeah, specifically that, that 7676 is a seventh day of rest with no mention of it as a holy feast day, and 7677 defined as a rest or a holy rest day with no distinction of it ever being a seventh day rest. So that was, again, another validation for what I found for the, you know, for the total of 115 accounts. <clears throat> and yeah, since so I have, so the three Shabbatons of Leviticus 23, 24, and verse 39 translated Sabbaths could be more with more clarity be sacred rest for those holy convocations that are allocated there. Um, yeah, so there's our layout again of the season that I showed you. And here's the whole calendar put all together, right? Spring, summer, winter, and fall. Okay, so that's the end of part one. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how much time I took, um, but I've got another. What's that? It's 45 right now? Okay, so technically I don't just want to want um, to say more? Well, if you guys will allow me. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. you guys okay for it? It's 10 All right. Minutes. All right, so we'll go into 10 minutes of this because some of this is probably worth seeing again. <laughs> you want to make a comment? I, well, I would like to defend the fourth day start of the calendar. Well, okay, well, can, can you do that after my time? Well, is this next? Continuing on what you've already said, or are you? Well, no, no, I'm, I'm now. No, no, I'm pulling more. I'm pulling more in Hebrew from other stuff okay. now. But still about the fifth day start. Yeah, and, and I know there's some. I know there's some oh, conscious people, thoughts see. about fourth day. I'm a, but, but but yeah, just kind of follow me. That's okay. okay. I appreciate you. I want I want you to finish. I didn't. I thought. Yeah, well, I, yeah, yeah, like I said, I got about another forty-five minutes, but I can give you a few more nuggets here. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is part two. Okay, is there any other dates that pose a particular day of the week? That's what we're looking for now. Okay, Exodus 16, the Manna chapter. I just have a quick question because I want to understand you guys. What are we establishing here? Just so we can. Well, I, what we're trying to. Sin entered? No, the day that the calendar starts in the year. Is the, is the first day of the calendar the fourth day of the week, or is the first day of the calendar the fifth day of the week? Exactly. Right. Okay. Right. But see, if you started on a particular day of the week, then all the numbers change, don't they? You know, and so, you know, some rabbi groups, they talk about this, uh, this splinter groups calendar. They say, oh, yeah, it starts on a Wednesday. Another faction of the rabbinical group says, oh, no, 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 it starts on a Friday. When in actuality, it's actually right in the Bible. Group. But anyway, well, let's go. So Exodus 16, the Mount of Chapter, do we have a particular date of the week? Yes, we do. And here's a proposed retranslation. I want you guys to take this up. If you guys have a concern about starting the calendar correctly, you get you guys need to investigate this for yourself. Okay? Okay. So this is Exodus 16, verses 1 and 2. And they pulled out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. Period. On the 15th day of the second month after departing out of Egypt, the whole congregation. We got, we got people congregating on the 15th day of the second month. What are they doing? That's not a feast time. Okay? This is when the Israelites murmured before Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Okay. Let's look at another one. Oh, okay. So to validate this idea. Okay, so, so I'm just saying, okay, so there was a congregation of people on the 15th of the second month. Well, what do we know about the rest of that chapter? Well, it says... There was, we, we know that there was a day of congregation, and we know that, hey, I'm going to, tomorrow, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you quail tonight, and I'm going to give you bread, starting tomorrow, for six days, right? All right, it says, in the morning, on the 15th, the bread from heaven began to rain for six days, and in the six days, they gathered twice as much, and then Moses said, tomorrow, will be the seventh day is the rest of the holy Shabbat. There's the word Shabbat. And so that would take you to the 22nd. So there you go. There's another validation that we have, because that 17 days short of or less than 22 is back to 15. That's a validation that the 15th day of the second month is a Shabbat. Okay? And again, this confirms if I count backwards. This confirms the same thing if I have the Day of Atonement on a Shabbat, and I count backwards, all these dates corroborate, and I continue to count back to the first month, the 14th day of the first month is a Wednesday, is on day four, for what day four means. This is everything behind day four for what Yeshua did and died for us. Because when he said, he said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the, whale, <clears throat> belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. So when did he raise from the dead? When I, have, when I evaluate, evaluate the Greek in the Gospels, it says mea sabaton, and all the translators Say it's the first day of the week. That's what that book's called. Okay. And I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what Shabbat means. Um, the, the, the next question. So meal separate home. So that, uh, that's like first day of the week. So does it fit in? Well, that's what they tell us it is, but it's right. not true. What do you think it is? Mia Shab Mia Sabaton. Mm -hmm. It's a transliteration from the Hebrew. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Okay, so the spring months, identical to the autumn months. I don't need to review that for you guys. Okay, if Passover was on a Wednesday, then the nation of Israel left Egypt on a Thursday. Fair enough? Okay. So Exodus 19, now we're going to the Mount Sinai chapter. Okay. 
And it says the nation of Israel came to Sinai in the third month on the same day that they left Egypt. Now, we know that can't be the same day of the month. If it was, we got more than 50 days leading up to Pentecost. See that? So we know they're talking about the day of the week. So the nation of Israel came to Sinai in the third month on the same day they left Egypt. So that mean, that would mean a Thursday. Okay? So follow me. So Thursday, and then Moses told the people, be ready unto the third day from Thursday. Thursday, Friday, Sabbath. Wait a minute, Mark. You're off base. Leviticus 23 tells me that Pentecost was the morrow after the Sabbath. That means Sunday. I'm sorry. That's not what it says in Hebrew. It says Marav Shabbat. Morning Sabbath. It's all the Constantinism people that want you to believe that it's Sunday stuff. Okay? We're going we're gonna to look into that. So if the nation of Israel left Egypt on a Wednesday, then that would mean Exodus 19 would put Pentecost on Friday. It's a problem. <clears throat> to verify the fact that the seventh day Sabbath is indeed the day of consummate uh, spirit, let's evaluate, evaluate the word Shabbat. Let's look at the word Shabbat. Okay, let's break it up. We know what Av means. Av, Av, right? We know that means father. If I put a shin in front of that, technically that means learned father. We know that, and sort of, we, we traditionally add, you know, have a double B sound in that. If we take that B all by itself, we know what that means. It means house. And then, of course, the last syllable, oath, refers to a sign or miracle. So we put this all together. What does Shabbat mean? The learned father house sign miracle, right? The dwelling place of the father's miraculous sign. That's what Shabbat is. Right? Shabbat is all about life. I've got an appendix in my book. It tells you what Adam did on his first Sabbath. It's pretty wild. I mean, it just reflects all this stuff. Okay? And so consequently, the resurrection should be on a day of the Father's miraculous son. His coming down in his spirit on Pentecost, should be on a day of his miraculous son. In order for Yahweh to be perfect. And so with a meaning like that, it would lend to, to the question of Yeshua's complete day in the grave, such, a, such on, a, 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 on such a day. Um, yeah, right. So yeah, talking about the Sunday content. So that wouldn't be very perfect. Okay. So uh, let me see if I can get to a point here. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, oh, yeah, well, here's an intro. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me go a few more slides and then I'll shut it off. Um, so the fifth day of the week is, is the day before the preparation of the seventh day Sabbath, right? We know the sixth day of the week is preparation. So this is kind of interesting. So, and so for unto the third day, we know the third day is the most repeated time prophecy in the Old Testament. And if you look at them all, this is interesting. These are all the things that Yahweh plans to do for us unto the third day. He will release us from darkness, prepare us with fasting, had us come before kings, purified us for cleansing, gave us healing. We entered into the promised land, finished the temple, prepared us to come before him. Bringing former latter rains will raise up, raise us up before him, and prepares us a feast, brings deliverance, and allows himself to be revealed. These are all the things unto the third day. I would, I would venture to say most of these would fall on Sabbath, Thursday, Friday, Sabbath. I don't have any, I don't have any uh, evidence to really back that up <clears throat> for all of those. But some of those we can do that. <clears throat> but yeah, the third day means completeness or resurrection. And so the third day from the crucifixion was our resurrection stuff, okay? So, so now, here's another clincher. This is important that you guys see this before I shut this off. Let's look at all the numbered days of the month throughout Scripture and see if the day relevant to Gamatria 
matches up. Is that fair enough? Okay. Okay, so other Seventh-day Sabbath events in the Old Testament. Here's the days of the month. And we know that the Sabbath would then therefore have to be a deliverance for Yahweh's people or judgment to those who are not or if they felt it, fell into iniquity. We know what that's about. Um, and uh, or convocation. Okay, so Israel, Israel declares pedigrees after their families on a Sabbath, except on a Shabbat. Aaron dies on Mount Hor on a Sabbath. This is interesting because I just a few months ago had learned what has been understood to be the, the story of how it came to be that Aaron died that day. Everything was laid out the day before in that cave for him to die on the Sabbath. Moses repeats all Yahweh has given him. What better day to do that? Israel crosses the Jordan. Ooh, they can't be doing that on the Sabbath. But what did they do? They went into the promised land. They were not doing any burdens. Think about all the work that's done in the tabernacle on Sabbath. This is what they were doing. This was a living tabernacle thing that these guys were working out. Remember what Sabbath means. Father's miraculous sign. Okay. <clears throat> Jeroboam ordained a feast of desecration. Now tell me, let me ask you a question. How can you, and this was on the 15th day of the eighth month, how can you desecrate something that's not a feast day unless you did it on a seventh day Sabbath? Another problem, don't we? Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem because the cup of iniquity for Judah was full. <clears throat> Jehoiakim is released from prison. Now, 2 Kings and uh, Jeremiah have slightly different dates. I think Jeremiah has the 25th of the 12th month. 2 Kings has the 27th. But what happened when the decree came down in Jeremiah for him to be released? And he was actually released on the 27th. So he actually had unto the third day to be released. Okay. And uh, Hezekiah dedicates the cleansed temple. What better day to cleanse a temple but on the day of the Father's miraculous son, right? And so Ezra arrives at Jerusalem to teach the people on the same day. The early, uh, early former rain poured out on Jerusalem. It makes sense that would be, and that's not Pentecost, but that would make sense it would be on a Sabbath. Nehemiah calls for reform on a solemn assembly. And again, that's the Sabbath after tabernacle, according to this. And Haman to kill the Israelites to receive his own death. Did you know that? Haman had put out a decree to defeat the God of the Israels, Israelites because he was going to destroy them on their very own Sabbath. That's what he wanted to do. That is the lot that he got because he casted lots. And he cast it for the 13th day of the 12th month. He wanted to kill the Jews on their own Sabbath. The word of Yahweh came to Ezekiel on that day. The word of Yahweh came down on to Daniel. Okay. I'd like to see you uh, see if we could find what day exactly that uh, there was a, uh, I think it was uh, one of the Nazi guys that was hung by the uh, court. And uh, when he was hung, he, he shouted out Palm Fest. And it was related to, it was it was very much connected to Haynes' death. Oh, uh, oh. oh. That's I'd interesting. Like to see if there's a correlation that, there. Okay, I'll talk to you about that. Okay, so now let's look at Thursday. Look at all, all the events now based upon this starting calendar date that would also, you know, looking at the number of days of the month, that would give us Thursday, right? And so consequently with the start that I've got, we put a lot of the feast on Thursday. Well, let's see what we got here for Thursday event. Now, initially, sin enters the Garden of Eden. This is Jubilee uh, 3, verse 17. Again, this is according to the calculation I came up with. And so the children of Israel, going back to the scriptures specifically, children of Israel go out from Egypt, Exodus 
13, on the 15th of the first. Children of Israel coming into the Sinai Desert, right? I was setting up the, uh, the tent of the tabernacle. It would make sense that it would be on the same day of the week that you're also doing the feast, right? Of course, I know that would also play out with a Wednesday, but, but anyway, kind of interesting. So the first day of unleavened bread was all, will also be the, the uh, 15th, the first month. Feast of trumpets, right? All these different feasts. First and last day of tabernacle is the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle on a Thursday, uh, the 20th day of the second month. They began to sanctify and came to the temple. So they were, began to sanctify that for three days leading up to a seventh day Sabbath. Um, and Ezra goes up from Babylon on a Thursday. Ezra counsels certain chiefs of the fathers on a different Thursday. That would be the uh, day of the choosing of the lamb. Yeah, that would put the choosing of the lamb on a Sabbath. Check that out. Okay, the covenant of transgression ends on this day. That would be the first day of the first month. Uh, wall of Jerusalem finished on this day. Word of Yah came unto Ezekiel. Word of Yahweh came unto Zechariah. Now look. Now let's look at Sunday. How many Sundays do we have with these days? Solomon began to build the temple. Second Chronicles three two on the second day of the second month. That was a Sunday. A day of feasting and gladness. This was the second day of Purim, right? When the Hebrews were celebrating the death of Haman and their deliverance. On the 14th was the 12th month. So these are the only two known events besides the translation, the translation, translators, interpretation of tomorrow after the Sabbath problem, um, the first day of the week. These are the only two known events for Sunday, the beginning of the work week, and the second day of Purim to, Purim to celebrate victory. So now let's look at this. So with this template, let's look at all the number of days that we can see how many times they're found. That's kind of significant too if you look at that. So let's look at that. Sunday, there's four times listed, only two events. Monday, there's 13 times. Tuesday, there's three times. Wednesday, there's 20 times. Thursday, there's 27 times. Friday, there's 10 times. Sabbath, there's 31 times. That's kind of significant too. Okay, so most rabbinical groups who comment on this so-called offshoot calendar, interestingly enough, are in agreement with the majority of the Dead Sea Scroll scholars who have analyzed the scrolls and fragments to determine the calendar starting on Wednesday, the fourth day of the week. Another problem with the fourth day of the week start, besides the Day of Atonement and Pentecost, is that it would also place the second day of the second month, the day that Solomon began construction of the temple on the seventh day south. Now, some people... Uh, who believe in a fourth day of the week start of the year say that, oh, this is a spurious, we got a problem, that it's spurious. No. Not with all the other evidence I just showed you. Okay, so most, yeah, most Sabbatarians would have a problem with trying to start building a temple on the Sabbath morning. Okay. And that so, question? what's that? Is that your last one? Uh, well, I well, let's see. Yeah, five after the Five after the hour? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, let me see. Don't, yeah, I, I, I could leave it at that, I guess. So fragments placed in a particular fashion and their, and their interpretations can be due to preconceived notions. Uh, let me just see what that one is. Oh, let me finish with this. Okay. So this, one, one more slide then. This conventional interpretation of the 364-day calendar has an extra, has, you know, looking at the Dead Sea Scroll issues, right, and the translations that are given. Okay. Uh, they have extra biblical feasts on a Sunday. On this morrow after the Sabbath game, right? They have the 26th of the, this is what they're saying, the barley festival, the Noah left the ark, the wine festival, the oil festival. These are all on Sunday, they say. And so here's, you know, and here's one of those translations. This is one of many, and they string all these together to kind of give you an idea of Wednesday, right? Castor is on the 14th. They say that on the 18th of the month is a Sabbath. Well, watch this. I'm going to show you this. So this would place the seventh day Sabbath on a Sunday. And what has 
the devil, what has Hasatan been doing for centuries since the Reformation, at least, you know, since from the, from the time of Constantine? Sunday is the Sabbath. We got the same spirit going on here. I got a problem with that. For Yahweh's way to be perfect, this would also mean that none of his feasts could ever fall on the venerable day of the sun. And so here's a quote from one of the more noted uh, Dead Sea Scroll translations, Why is A Big and Cook? Understanding the process by which the scrolls have been put together will help you to avoid the reader's cardinal sin, trusting the author too much. Okay, so we'll leave it there. Very good. Entertain one. According to, the, according to this timepiece that I've got allocated, the 13th day of the 12th month was the day that he was killed. That was the day. No, no, that was the day that Haman was killed. On the 13th day of the 12th month, which was a Shabbat. According to this analysis of the count. Well, yeah, I gave you a whole slide for Thursday. I gave you a whole slide for Saturday. It's all on that 16th day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so. I, I don't know. Somebody's got to. Somebody's got to answer this stuff for me. To for me to change my mind. Yeah. One more. Um, sorry, how quick can you? Yes. yes. Well, I'm thinking I need more time yeah. to do that. Oh, I think I don't that's want to look like I don't know if it can be squeezed in. So what <clears> you <throat> said is fresh in everyone's mind. Put Jackson's back. Yeah. yeah. We can do something like that. Um. Okay. That was Liz. Um. Liz Lee. Which one of your programs are um, short? Which are short? Is, is, yours, is yours less than 45 minutes? <clears throat> I've cut it short from the rest of the book. I, I, don't know. I was on, let me kill me and shut this down. Okay. Are we going to take 10 minutes? We're going to take five instead of 10. Which one? Yeah, take five. Go for it. So is yours short of leave? I don't know. I guess so. I, I don't know.